Welcome to Lesson 4A, Control Volume Example, Flat Plate Boundary Layer. In this lesson, we'll work through an example problem using the control volume or integral equations for mass and momentum, namely friction drag on a flat plate boundary layer. Here's the setup. We have a 2D flat plate. The flow coming in is uniform at U infinity with constant pressure P infinity. We're showing only one side of the plate where the boundary layer grows. Note that this is not to scale. The actual boundary layer will be extremely thin. We also note that we're talking about laminar flow. We want to calculate the drag per unit depth. It's a function of x location. Of course, the farther we go down the plate, the larger d becomes. And b is the depth of the plate into the page. I typed up the first part of the solution to save time. We picked a control volume as shown here. We show surfaces 1, 2, 3, and 4, but there are actually two more one in the plane and one in front of the plane at distance b. We'll call those 5 and 6. You can pick several different control volumes. The one I picked here follows a streamline. As we'll see, that'll make our algebra easier. This streamline veers upward in order to conserve mass, because this portion of the flow, the boundary layer, doesn't carry as much fluid as this portion. Therefore, the streamline must veer upward. Our coordinate system is x, y, and z is out of the plane. First, let's look at conservation of mass. Since this flow is steady and incompressible, this first term goes away. Note that when we say incompressible, we typically also assume very small temperature changes and constant fluid properties. For example, viscosity mu is constant. This control surface integral is split up into all six of our surfaces, but the one in the plane and the one in the plane out of the page are zero because this flow is two-dimensional. I include them simply because we have to have a closed control surface. This is a mass flux, and there's no mass flux into or out of the page. Consider the first integral here for surface 1. This is the leftmost surface. The element of area dA is to the left, and the velocity vector is to the right, and u is constant equal to u infinity. The area element itself, if we try to make this three-dimensional, has some small height dy and a depth out of the page equal to b. So that's my attempt at a 3D view of this surface. The velocity vector is u infinity 0, 0, and dA is negative b dy 0, 0. It's negative because dA points in the negative x direction. This integral has ui dAi, which is a dot product, so we get negative u infinity b dy. This integral then becomes rho, since rho is constant, we take it outside. We integrate from y equal 0 to capital H1, and then plug in this term for ui dAi. But these are also constants, so we bring them outside the integral as well. But this integral is simply H1. So finally, we have this equation for this integral in equation, which I'll call 2, having called this equation 1 up here. I point out that this negative sign makes sense because these terms represent mass flow rate out of the control volume, whereas here mass is flowing into this surface, thus the negative sign. Now let's examine surface 2. This is the surface on the right side of the control volume, so dA and u are in the same direction. Here u is a function of y, and dA is b dy 0, 0. Therefore the dot product is u times b dy. V dropped out because of this zero. And note that V is not zero itself, because the streamline veers up as we move along in X. We write our integral for surface two, again taking the B and the row out, as the integral from Y equals zero to H2 of U dy. Now let's move on to surface three. This is the surface along the wall, again trying to make this three-dimensional. We have some thin slice of dimensions DX and B, dA is downward into the wall, but u is zero by the no-slip condition on the wall. So ui dAi is zero, and this integral is zero. In other words, there's no flow through the wall. Now consider surface four, which is the top surface of our control volume. This is the one that follows the streamline. dA is everywhere perpendicular to the control surface, and u is parallel to this control surface since it's a streamline. This is true anywhere along the streamline. Therefore, ui dAi is zero, since you should remember that the dot product is zero when the two vectors are perpendicular. 
I like to say that this was a wise choice of control volume because of this simple result for surface 4. So the integral for surface 4 is 0. We add all these four together, and equation 2 becomes 0 equal negative b rho u infinity h1 plus this second term integral. But the b's cancel, and the rho's cancel, and we can write this as u infinity h1 equal integral of 0 to h2 over surface 2 of u dy. This is our final expression for equation 2, and I'll call it equation 3. Now consider linear momentum. I'll write out the control volume form of the linear momentum equation, where I'll leave the stress tensor as Tij for now, just to save some writing. We'll use our constitutive equation later. This is a vector equation with i as the free index, so we'll let i equal 1. I'll change all these i's to 1's. Well, again, this is a steady flow, so the first term goes away. The gravity vector will assume to act into the page in the negative z direction. So g1 is 0, and this term also goes away. So the linear momentum equation reduces to only two integrals in the x direction, which I'll call equation 4. I'll call this the left-hand side and the right-hand side of equation 4. But these are both control surface integrals, so we need to split them into all six surfaces of our control volume, just as we did with conservation of mass. The left-hand side of equation 4, surface 1, is the integral over surface 1 from y equals 0 to h1 of rho u1 uj daj. Again, since surface 1 is the left surface, u is constant with the first component u infinity, and da is negative b dy 0, 0 as before. So this grouping of terms becomes u infinity, which is our u1, times the dot product of u and dA, which is negative u infinity b dy plus 0 plus 0. So the surface integral for surface 1 on the left-hand side of equation 4 becomes, after we put the minus rho u infinity squared b from here on the outside of the integral, just an integral of dy, which again is just h1. So finally, the left-hand side of 4 for surface 1 is minus rho b u infinity squared h1. But let's plug in equation 3 to get negative rho b u infinity integral of u dy over surface 2. This form will be most useful to us. Now consider surface 2. Again, we had u equal u v 0, and dA is b dy 0, 0. So u1 u j dA j is u, which is a function of y, u b dy plus 0 plus 0 when we take the dot product. So the left-hand side of 4 for surface 2 is the integral over surface 2, and we'll put the row outside, u1 uj dA daj equal b rho integral of 0 to h2 over surface 2 u squared dy, where you see that coming from here. We summarize term 2 here. Now consider surface 3, which is the wall, our flat plate. Again, u1 is 0. So the left-hand side of 4 for surface 3 is 0. In other words, there's no flow of momentum through the wall. Finally, consider surface 4, which was the top surface along our streamline. We still have dA being perpendicular to u everywhere. So uj daj, the dot product, is 0 along surface 4. Thus, the left-hand side of equation 4 for surface 4 must be 0 since this dot product is 0. This is thus our final equation for surface 4 left-hand side. We combine the results of all four surfaces and write 4 left-hand side, which is the control surface of row u1, uj daj, equal b rho integral over surface 2, 0 to h2, u squared dy, minus b rho u infinity, integral over surface 2, u dy. Now you can see why I rewrote this term, which was surface 1, in terms of surface 2. Now we can combine these two integrals and write the left-hand side of equation 4, after a little bit of rearrangement in this way, and I'll call this 4 left, where notice that I've combined these two terms, and by putting u infinity squared outside, I can write this in terms of u over u infinity. Now consider the right-hand side of equation 4. Again, letting i be 1, we have the control surface integral of t1j daj. Again, we split it up into our six surfaces, and all these integrals are of t1j daj. Again, these terms go away, as they did with the left-hand side, since it's two-dimensional. t1j daj 
is the sum of T11 dA1 plus T12 dA2 plus T13 dA3. And now we'll use the constitutive equation, which we had derived for a Newtonian fluid, namely Tij is minus P delta Ij plus mu del Ui del Xj plus del Uj del Xi. We're interested only in the component when I equal 1. So T11 is negative P plus 2 mu del U del X. T12 is mu del U del Y plus del V del X. And T13 is mu del U del Z plus del W del X. But nothing is varying in Z, and W is 0. So this term is 0, because it's a 2D flow. So let's apply these components to the right-hand side of equation 4. We'll examine surface 1. 4 right-hand side 1 is the integral over surface 1, T1J dAj. As before, we write out vectors u and dA. So T1J dAj is T11 times negative B dy. But from above, T11 is negative P infinity plus 2 mu del u del x. But since u is a constant, del u del x is 0. So this reduces to negative p infinity times negative b dy. And so for right hand side 1 is the integral over surface 1. And since these two negative signs cancel, we get b p infinity dy. These are both constants which can come outside the integral. So for right hand side 1 is b p infinity h1. Note that we did all this algebra, but since surface 1 is the left side of the control volume, and it's exposed to a constant pressure, p infinity, and the height is h1, and the depth into the page is b, we could have written down right away that 4 right hand side 1 is p infinity times the area of the surface, which agrees with what I have here. So dude, you did kind of a Rube Goldberg approach to the problem, man. <laughs> I guess you could say that, Joe. Now consider surface 2, u is uv0, and dA is B, D, Y, 0, 0. So summing over the J's, T, 1, J, D, A, J, equal B, T, 1, 1, D, Y. But as we wrote above, T, 1, 1 is minus P infinity plus 2 mu del U del X. We could keep this second term in, but we're going to approximate this as negligibly small by the boundary layer approximation. Remember, this boundary layer is extremely thin, so the boundary layer approximation is that P is constant through this surface 2, and u equal u of y, and del u del x is extremely small. So we have equation 4, right hand side of surface 2, is the integral over surface 2, y equals 0 to h2, t1j dAj, and plugging everything in, we get the integral from 0 to h2, negative p infinity b dy. And I'll use an approximation symbol here because of our approximations. This ends up being negative b, p infinity, h2, which again is just the pressure force on the right surface of our control volume. So for right hand side 2 is minus b, p infinity, h2. Now consider surface 3, for right hand side 3, is the integral of t1, j, dA, j, where here u is 0 and dA is 0, negative b, dx, 0. This is the surface along the plate, the bottom surface. So summing the j's, t1 j dA j is negative t1 2 b dx. But recall that t1 2 is the same as the deviatoric part, tau 1 2, which is mu del u del y plus del v del x. Well here v equals 0 along the wall. There's no flow through the wall. So del v del x is also 0. So tau 1 2 is mu del u del y along the wall, which we call tau w, the wall shear stress. It's a function of x along the plate. So this becomes 4 right hand side over surface 3 is the integral over surface 3 from x equals 0 to some x negative tau w b dx, where we've plugged in t12 into here in this integral. But we know that d, which is the total drag on the plate, one side, is equal to the integral from 0 to x of tau w b dx just by integrating shear stress along the wall. So finally we write for right hand side 3 is negative d, the drag. d is our unknown, what we are solving in this example problem. Adding up all the integrals for right hand side 
is the sum of these four integrals of t1j dAj. This term was b p infinity h1. This term was minus b p infinity h2. And this term is negative of the drag. So 4 right hand side is equal to those three terms plus this final integral over surface 4. And I'll just remind you that this second term is an approximation for a boundary layer. In particular, a boundary layer at high Reynolds number, but still laminar, so that delta is very thin. The larger the Reynolds number, the thinner the boundary layer, and the better this approximation. So all that's left is this term, 4. Surface 4 is the integral over surface 4, t1j dAj. Again, surface 4 is our streamline at the top. At some point along this streamline, dA is perpendicular to the control surface. It has components dy in the horizontal direction and dx in the vertical direction. But this portion of the control volume has dimensions dx dy. So we write dA equal negative b dy, b dx zero, where again b is the depth out of the page. So t1j dAj along this surface is t11 times dA1, which is b dy with a negative sign, plus t12 times dA2, which is b dx from here, plus zero. But t11 is minus p infinity plus two mu del u del x. Well, this is approximately zero since u is u infinity outside the boundary layer. t12 is equal to mu del u del y plus del v del x. Again, u equal u infinity, which is a constant. What about this term? Remember the boundary layer approximation for a thin boundary layer is that v is very small compared to u, and derivatives with respect to x are much less than derivatives with respect to y. Since we have both of these happening in this term, this is a higher order term, which is very small, in fact negligible in the outer flow, which is a free stream flow with a small tilt upward. We could keep this term in, but for simplicity, we will neglect this term. Plugging all this in, 4 right hand side for surface 4 equal b integral over surface 4, y going from h1 to h2, negative p infinity, negative dy. This comes from the t11 dA1 term from up here, and the t12 term is approximately 0. So this reduces to b p infinity h2 minus h1. Just as a side here, in undergraduate class, we would simply take the x component of the pressure force, which is just the projected pressure force on this vertical surface, which is p infinity times height h2 minus h1 times the depth out of the page b. So again, this agrees with our undergraduate analysis. So for right hand side 4 is b p infinity h2 minus h1. Putting all this together for right hand side, which was the integral of t1j dAj equal b p infinity h1 minus b p infinity h2 minus d plus b p infinity h2 minus h1. But this term cancels with this term, and this term cancels with this term, and all we're left with is negative d. Summarizing, we had four left hand side, which we had called equation 4L. And we have 4 right hand side, which is just negative d, which we'll call equation 4r. And thus equation 4 becomes d equal b rho u infinity squared integral over surface 2, 0 to h2, u over u infinity, 1 minus u over u infinity dy. Now we argue that h2 can be any y above the edge of the boundary layer. And commonly, we let this h2 go to infinity. And we define theta, which we call the momentum thickness, as the integral from 0 to infinity of u over u infinity, 1 minus u over u infinity, dy. This is the momentum thickness of a boundary layer. And it has the same form as this when we let h2 be infinity. So finally, the drag is b rho u infinity squared times theta, or the drag per unit depth out of the page is rho u infinity squared theta. This, of course, is on one side of the plate. Thus, after all this work, we get our final answer for the drag per unit depth. The caveat is that it's valid for a very thin boundary layer, which would be a boundary layer at high Reynolds number, but still laminar.
So Reynolds number based on X must be less than about 10 to the fifth for this to be valid. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos. One, two, three. That's all there is to it.